Now, Andrew, for the first two tests that the teams do, they need to test the utility of the item and be visually interesting. For the judges, once you get the last to somewhere between three and eight finalists, we really want to put it to its test. One thing we'll probably do that would be visually interesting is puncture a tire or smash a brick. And then one of the things I really want to do is really put it to the limit of its metallurgical capability. I've got one here with me. So you have the ads. Generally, the basics of mechanical advantage for this, you have a two-inch wide ad. It's a class one lever, 30-inch long shaft. Um, mostly what we're using this for is inward swinging doors come down. We can leverage them open or outward swinging doors. We can get around the door and then pry back, breaking the lock. You have a pick, so this is about six inches long for both of these. Uh, this one is brand new. It arrived in the mail yesterday. It's not sharp. That's one thing that I wish they would do at the forge, but they don't own this tool. Punctures, uh, breaking windows, puncturing tires. We'll slam them into a floor, the bailout rope tied to it, jump out the window. This will hold three to 600 pounds, shock loaded pretty easily if you throw it into uh, decking. Uh, octagonal shaft, about one inch, inch and a sixteenth, somewhere in there. You have the shoulders, the forks, so two tines. Uh, in between, you have a crotch, and we have the bevel side and the inner side. So those are the, the general parts here. And then the back of any of the working surfaces are poles. So if I'm going to strike the forks in, I have the forks pole or the ads pole or the pick pole. One of the tests that we're likely to do is to put the pick in something and hit it with a 10 or 12 pound sledgehammer to see if we can break the pick off. But these are the kinds of tests we're going to end up doing if they make it to the finals. If they're just doing the ordinary test, it'll have to do what an ordinary Halligan bar will do. But the final test will be more aggressive to try and see how capable it is. I was thinking a little bit about that. These are capable of shearing locks, like padlocks and hockey puck locks, just by twisting them really fast. You'll occasionally see forks break doing that, okay. uh, or throwing the uh, the pick through a, a padlock staple and driving it. You might get one to shear that way as well. Okay, that sounds great. This was an interesting break, but this is what I would have anticipated. The biggest difference, this actually is a sweet spot for the forging guys and a difficult one for the casting guys. It's not as sweet as you might hope, as Ben pointed out last time, making these right angle things with a big fat thing on that end. You can't really do it out of a straight one inch bar. So it takes a little bit of horsing around. So Andrew, you probably know how they forge this thing. Do they start out with a, a bigger bar and forge the bar part um, so so on the head? The one on the left here of your screen, that is a welded pick. That's I was going to say, I could head. see that weld all the way around there. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, and so that one is a pretty popular break. Like that outnumbered anything else was the picks broken off of the leather head. I've done it to see two of them actually in the same morning, new out of the box. I'm not saying it's a bad tool. I know the guys that uh, designed it. It I does tend to that. break right I mean, there a lot. How they make these, not in that case, that one's a little bit different because that is a forged bar. They fold the ads up and then weld on the pick. If we look at like, this is a Council TD-30. This is a an, another forged bar, but it's a single piece. They forge this ads flat out. I haven't been to the forge to see it. I'm supposed to go here at some point. Uh, but from what I'm told, they forge it flat out and then they stick it in a vise and bend it down uh, after reheating the head. I know the, the Pro Bar from FHU, which is the most popular halogen bar on the market, they do a similar process. There's a little more variability in their head. So I'm thinking they probably heat it back further than they do at council. As far as like angles go, when they do fold this down, I know they check it at council's forge that the radius arc is the same, every bar. 
So 30 inches to the, the forks, 30 inches to the forks. But these are, are hand bent in a vise for most of the manufacturers, if not all of the forged manufacturers. Paratech should be the same way. Let's see, Hazel's is cast. I'm not sure what Firemall's doing, to be honest. Theirs is forged now. I haven't had my hands on one long enough to know. That's great information. So yeah, this I, I didn't recognize that this is a welded on structure. And that's always going to be difficult with these particular materials. When we work with the DOD people, as soon as you start getting the alloy steels that you run up to relatively high hardness, it's difficult to get a weld that doesn't inherently have some lack of toughness. And mm -hmm. one of the distinctions that's not easy for the non-metallurgical people to get their head around, there's a difference between ductility and toughness. Mm -hmm. Ductility is if I put it and I have an ordinary load and I increase the load until it bends, how much it bends before it breaks is ductility. If I get it cold and hit it with a hammer so it cracks, that's toughness. And we test that with a thing called a Sharpie V-notch, where we take something that's basically a little less than a half an inch by a half an inch. We cut a groove in it. We normally get it minus 40 degrees. And then we have a hammer that swings at it. And we measure how much energy absorbs when we break it. And that's toughness. And in an implement like this, you wouldn't expect toughness to be really a limitation on the performance just because you can't load it that fast, typically. But on this, if you hit it with a hammer, you would have that kind of fast load where you might have a toughness limitation rather than just a ductility. The big yeah. benefit that the forging people get is they crush the porosity that comes when you make a casting. So every steel part whether it's an ingot or a steel mill part or a forging when we pour the liquid steel to make the original ingot it has places where three grains are growing as a solid and they're surrounded by liquid and where the three grains come together you can't get any more liquid in there and when the liquid turns into a solid there's not enough volume so you end up with a hole between those three grains and that's micro porosity and all steels have that micro porosity. When I forge it, I crush that micro porosity and forge weld it together. So you forge weld those porosity shut, but, and so you eliminate most of the very big ones and you eliminate about 80 to 90% of the little ones but you still have little ones. So I'm sure, Andrew, when you look at these carefully, you'll see little bitty porosity in almost every fracture surface you see. And that's just an artifact of steel making. And so when you weld it, you end up with sections that have really low hardness in the heat affected zone, and that'll really cause it to break. So yeah. what about this one on the right, this just look, looks like it lost its edge. So uh, one one other note on those, um, we generally see them break at the heat affected zone. I don't believe they're cooling these, like doing controlled cooling. So I've got some bars that I have heated with oxyacetylene to rebend and like to try to preserve it. We bury them in sand and leave them overnight. Same thing if we're going to weld anything on the bars. I don't believe they're doing that at the factory for those. But uh, yeah, so the one on the right, I believe this is either an older council or a paratech. It's a little hard to tell from how grainy that okay. is. So that All one's right, snapped we'll off on. the end. Yeah. Um, you mentioned rebending the halogen bar. How common is that? Do um... it's not okay. Uh, <laughs> it, it's not common to do those sorts of field repairs and fix your or, well, lot. not field repair, but yeah. Well, so a lot of people aren't going to try. They're just going to throw them away. It's possible to cold bend them, um, which we do more with hooks than with halogen bars, uh, sitting them underneath the outrigger on a ladder truck. It's a big hydraulic press that actually lifts the truck off the ground. So I can put some wooden cribbing underneath and rebend it uh, cold. But uh, we had a couple that were actually, they were uh, factory blemish ones that had the wrong angle on the, uh, the ads as I got them for free. And we, we re them with a torch. Uh, 
I know there are people who've done it. Um, it is possible to bend the the angles completely weird on these or bend the shafts on them. I have several that have bent shafts for one reason or another. And it's possible to, to heat them up with a torch and move them. It's just not many people are doing it because generally these are bought by municipalities. They're getting replacements from their employer, even the personally owned ones. You know, you throw it in a pile in the garage and, and buy a new one. You know, it's when I made mine, I used 4140 chromoly steel, the mm -hmm. same stuff you use for bicycle tubes and stuff. But it was heat treated after all the forging was done. And, and I would, even the ones that's welded, if you were to heat treat it after the weld, so you do all your normalization, you do your quench and temper, that would mitigate that break right there at the weld quite a bit because you're getting all of the, uh, the grain structure the same. There's no like radical change of grain structure. But if you use a torch and bend these things, you're killing the temper to the mm -hmm. point where now they're soft, softer than, I mean, they're, they're overbuilt on purpose, but uh, yeah, that would, I would imagine you see rebending of torch straightened parts more readily than you do mm -hmm. of the factory part. Yeah. We're still using them in classes. It was mostly that we got them for free and can fix them. Sure, sure. But like, I'm trying to think of where some of them have gone because a couple got given away and they get, they get used quite a bit and they're not rebending. I had, I'm trying to think of any other ones that I've seen. I have a couple that I've welded on uh, after production because I can't get these, you know, pre-heat treating. It's, it's interesting uh, because you could, on the end there, just heat it up and slow cool it, normalize it in air, and then heat it up, quench it, and temper it. And the fact that you'd have a heat-affected zone at the end where it, you've lost the temper probably wouldn't have much of an effect because you're way back on the bar. You wouldn't have as much of a load. So you could really do that if you wanted to optimize the properties of the end. Um, yep. and, and you wouldn't, you'd only need to heat treat the very end of it. You wouldn't have to even get much of the bar hot. Yeah. So and that, yeah, my, my thought was when I, when I heat treated mine that I, I could do one side kind of towards the middle and the other side kind of towards the middle because in the very middle of the handle is the least, you know, for, if you assume you're going to be using both ends as a lever, the middle yep. of the handle is the least, you know, what worry about part. It's got the least torque on it. So mm -hmm. I, I so, made sure that the head and the first like foot down on both sides were both be treated. I have it here, by the way. I, I think that's right. Oh, is that yours? Yeah. It took a lot of effort to get enough mass right where this meets this. You know, to have enough of a pole on both sides. You have the forks in there. This is the That's parent stock right here. So it's two inches by an inch. That's what I started with. And so making the forks was the easy bit. Making this part was the complicated part. I thought Andrew's observation last year that on the forks, that fork is sized so that you can get it over the lock of the door so you could pop the lock out. I thought that was really fascinating. That technique's only been around probably a couple of years. Um, people have used them for uh, twisting chain. Uh, there, there are a bunch of, uh, like we use them to shut off gas meters uh, between the forks there. Uh, but yet yeah, sizing it for over the lock is a more recent thing, probably in the last 10 years. Uh, I know the guy who developed the, the technique, I just don't know when he did it. But yeah, that's probably essential for newer bars. Innovation's really interesting. Innovation in retrospect is obvious, but prospectively is never that obvious. Right. So this looks like the kind of break I would expect if you had a cast bar. So the two different bars here. The one on the left is a single piece forged bar. It's a okay. FH, uh, FHU Pro bar. So that one, they, they broke in the same way. The one on the right is another leather head. It's welded. But the one on the left is, is single piece forged. And if you look at where it's broken there, you can see a little bit of clean metal and you can see some, some dirty rusted metal. Yeah, uh, micro fracture. Mm -hmm. And my guess is what's happening with a lot of these is you've got a small crack and we are putting some serious vibration into these bars. You hit that with an eight, you know, sometimes 10, 12, 14 pound tool up to a full swing with one of those is like 70, 80 miles an hour. Wow. Uh, when it gets hit, it'll make your hands ring. We're sure. wearing fairly heavy gloves. 
that are insulated for heat. You can see a, a pair of them there on the left, but it, they, they ring and it's a tuning fork. Yeah. So the amount of vibration we're putting these under just exploits any kind of damage in sure. the tool and it shakes itself apart. Yeah, uh, that brown, the, the, it's about half of it. The uh, spike is brown and half is gray. That mm -hmm. brown means that it was there during the temper. It's oh, been okay. sitting there waiting to die for a long mm -hmm. time. Yep, yep. Yep. And if I remember correctly, that's Rutherford County, Tennessee. They're they're fairly busy. And that bar, I'm thinking that's my friend Dustin Sinclair's personal bar. He had probably been using it for about 10 years before that broke, if that's the one I'm thinking it is. Wow. Well, all right. And I, I, so I could take that back. I could walk it back a little bit. If it's been being used for 10 years, it's been in and out of a water environment. That could have started as a... Uh, house fire, structure fires in general are incredibly humid places. It's something you wouldn't think about, but one of the byproducts of combustion is water and smoke is incredibly humid. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we're also putting hundreds of, to thousands of gallons of water onto a fire. <laughs> that white smoke that you start seeing during extinguishment is mostly humidity. Uh, it will rust everything it touches uh, pretty quickly. So... Yeah, this, this is interesting. How hard, uh, Rockwell C. Hardness, would a bar like this be? Do you 40 know? to 42, I believe, uh, is what the council was. Pro bars, similar from what I've heard. I've never tested it. Okay. Uh, okay. Max mod. The, the metallurgical side of me is interesting because these high-performance steels, when they're heat-treated to high strength levels, are vulnerable to stress corrosion cracking. And when you do the heat treatment on this, you always end up with tension on the inside and compression on the outside. So one could speculate that it may have had some stress corrosion cracking into it so that it took some time to crack. And you get that kind of appearance in the crack itself where it was just cracking over time because it's a corrosion event. But then when you finally hit it hard, it, you'd reduce a cross section, you had a sharp enough crack, you finally busted it. Yeah. That's cool. All right. It's interesting to see the ads on the right uh, where they they tried to fill it, the, the spot between the, the pole and the spike, but mm -hmm. they did it with a conical section instead of a radius section. So it still made a stress riser right at the end of that cone. You know what I mean? It's like right where your where your uh, cursor is there. It's mm -hmm. you you yeah. really want to have a nice curved transition, but this is a sharp transition, mm -hmm. better than a right angle. So those are machine good. welded now. They didn't used to be. They they uh, the older generation. Oh, that's a weld. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the one. Oh, the right's okay. That's the same as the the bar from the first uh, set of, of pictures there. Like I said, this is a very common break on these tools, the leather heads in particular, but it's almost always right at that heat affected zone. There was one I sent you that I hadn't seen before where it's it broken in the socket, like they just didn't have any penetration on the weld. It almost looks like a dimple, but yeah, these are, they have like a little uh, dimple on the end of the pick and a socket. Okay. On top. Yeah. And I didn't realize they were welding that. I, I was wondering what this was all about. But if this is a welded joint, that makes all the sense in the world that you get that kind of, because that's weld metal that's attached that broke down into the weld joint. And you can see that even in the weld itself. Now, is this a full penetration weld so that it's all weld metal? No. Okay. That makes sense. And you can see here that you have the same kind of event that we would have in castings. You've got a little bit of centerline shrink or something there that's not been healed by forging or whatever, but it didn't have any effect on the performance. It wouldn't have failed because of that. It, it failed because of the heat affected zone weld lack of toughness. And Andrew, these are plugged into a hole and then welded, right? Yeah. Like stuck in and then then just circumference. Uh, it's not deep enough to actually strike it in. So if you see here, this is a leather head that is broken from just absolutely no penetration going on right there. Mm -hmm. So this is how they happen to do it. I wouldn't probably put the welded pick on a bar anyways, but if I was going to do it, I'd, I'd do it a little differently. But uh, yeah, I thought that 
was probably since we were just talking about that a pretty good um yeah so that that plug doesn't unless it snapped out the plug also that plug doesn't seem very deep in there mm -hmm. no it's not at all so this is either a single piece forged bar this is either an fhu pro bar or it could be uh an iaf halogen which was a clone of the pro bar but it was made uh casted so it might be one of the two i i can't tell from the okay the as they are looking exactly. down the ads it looks like i see a parting line like as if it were cast probably or so drop forged that is a flame fighter it is press fit this is the one i was talking about last time okay uh, so why anyone did this i have no idea uh, <laughs> but it is yeah it, so they they fit the head on and i can't remember from the one time i've i've had a broken one in my hands i try i'm trying to order one right now they're back ordered it's not even like that end is tapered it's just run out on a lathe or something and then they put the head on there and squeeze it and that's yeah, all you know are together and the amount of these I, I've never seen one that's gone under any amount of use that's still intact. The fun part about these, you know how they do the press fit, right? They cool the handle and mm -hmm. they heat the head, it's making the head expand. And then they put the head on the handle and let it all cool down together. So the part your hands are holding, which you'd like to keep cool, they cool. And the part that you're going to stick into the fire end, if they heat, and then the thing comes apart. We see them break a lot in training. They don't make it much further than that. That is a pinned uh, Paratech hooligan on the left. On the right, it's a, another flame fighter that's come off in exactly the same way. On the left, that one is a pinned bar. They make three pieces, so you get the shaft and the two head assemblies, and they're socketed in. And depending on the model, it might be all the way through as a rivet. It might be pinned only through one side, or it could be a, a sheet metal roll pin. They made them all three ways. They also then made welded variations of this. The two I have, one of them is only through from one side, and then the other one's a solid rivet. But I have seen them with sheet metal roll pins. We tend to torque them a good bit just because you're putting a, you know, that's the fork assembly into a door uh, and then hitting it with something big that's never hitting it straight on. It's always at some kind of a slight angle. And my guess is, just too many times of hitting down on the ads probably and just torquing it to the side probably sure. snap the pivot on that i don't know the exact story on that one somebody sent me that picture the one on the left i was there for uh that just that's a uh, council generation one halligan um the one that i designed replaced that one uh and my guess is that they had the forks from two bars linked together and we're using it to as a big cheater bar um, based on where that bend is but yeah it finally just let go and whoop oh sure sure that was it looks uh, like you could I see two years ago looks like you can see where their heat treatment ended too because otherwise it would have been closer to the head unless mm -hmm. it was going around something you know as no so uh if i remember correctly what they probably did because that was at the other side of that uh training center from where i was standing uh they were pulling they had the ads in a door uh and they had the forks linked to another bar and they were pulling backwards and instead of the ads bending the shaft bent i've also failed one in a very similar way one of the newer ones but it was a state swat team that was using a 40 pound battering ram to drive padlocks off of a chain and you know guys that are just paid pretty much to work out and clear rooms with a 40 pound battering ram it, it's a lot of force they're lifting them up well over their head and driving them straight down it's thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds which is bent the middle of the shaft on one of my bars sure i, I mean from a material standpoint this is a success <laughs> this is not a failure. This is a success. I can do that if I load it enough, but you'd probably rather have it do this than pop that off. Yeah. yeah. So marrying bars like that, using a hook is a, to extend leverage. I'm not a huge fan of the techniques. One, it's very, very hard on the tools. 
it's very easy to overload them, but also we're not getting anything out of it because you know, force equals mass times acceleration, and we're missing out on the acceleration part. If I'm doubling the distance that I have to cover, I can't cover in the same amount of time to get the the same amount of, of sure. force at the other end. So it's not really a like a true mechanical like one to one comparison for mechanical advantage. Like I extended the lever double the distance, but I'm not getting twice the force out of it. So I'm not a huge fan of the the techniques for that, and I've seen it break a lot of bars. That's really interesting, Andrew. I mean, all of us who work on things know exactly what you're talking about if you think about it. If I have a big frozen bolt, in the past, I'd get my half-inch bar and put mm -hmm. the socket on and put a piece of pipe on it, and I'm either going to bend the bar or break the bolt. But if I have an impact wrench with a socket on it, I probably get the nut off. And yeah. so that's exactly what you were talking about, impact versus just load. Yeah, yeah that's, that's why to open a door, they don't use a battering push. They use a ram that comes in at, at velocity. Yeah. I think that's all I had. I mean, I was going to spend a few minutes for the casting people talking about how critical it is. This is a Sharpie V-notch. And so these are bars. These are cast material. You can see you get a different microstructure in that fracture. And the, these great nuts here are really what I was talking about, where you get porosity between the grains. And you can see in here, you still get a little bit of that, but not much because you squeeze most of it out in the rolling operation. So you can actually look and see the big holes in here, but they're not really not that big. That's half a millimeter there. So it's really pretty small stuff. Uh, and this really shows that it's not the pushing the atoms closer together in forging that makes it work. <laughs> I mean, everybody has this legacy idea that I'm either getting rid of uncleanliness or I'm pushing the atoms closer together when I forge it. I'm not doing that. What it's I'm really doing is crushing out the porosity. So one of the things we do now is called hot isostatic pressing. And so this is, Andrew, by the way, way too expensive, but probably not really to do with Halligan bar because now it's only like a, an expensive heat treatment. So it's probably $10 or $15 a pound instead of 2 or $3 a pound. So it wouldn't be horrendously expensive. But basically, before you do that final heat treatment, you take it up to 2,000 degrees and put it under basically 100 atmospheres gas pressure and crush the holes. And the part doesn't yeah, change okay. size. I think I've read about this, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't change size, but you can see here these orange circles are way up here in terms of reduction in area, which is how much it necks down before it breaks when you do the tensile test. And so you can see that the hips are way up here in terms of having huge ductility. If I have a steel chill, I can get up here. So if I'm a casting person, I'm going to probably put a steel chill on those critical areas to get the fastest solidification rate and the smallest holes. If I just do a, a normal thing, then I can have so much porosity. I have very little. And you can see this is the fracture surface porosity. That is, when I look at where it broke, I can characterize how much of the surface area is porosity. And you can see it doesn't take much. 2% porosity on that fracture surface really reduces, and it acts like a notch. It forces the failure to be in that section. So if I'm a casting person or even a forging person, I really want to make sure that those sections that are going to be most heavily loaded have the best properties. And so since you're really using the mechanical advantage, it's really the junction where I'm really concerned about is here, here, and here. Those are the places where it's going to fail. If it fails somewhere else, then I've done something weird. So if I bend it here, I did something weird. <laughs> okay, <laughs> It's sort of like if you overload a bolt, it's going to break in the thread where the load is. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't break there, there's something wrong with the bolts. <laughs> and, and here, if it doesn't break here or here, there's something weird that happened. At least that's my understanding, Andrew. You can say whether or not that's true. 
one of the things to note with the study that Raymond was talking about is that's a very high strength steel. For more ductile steels, it is very forgiving when it comes to porosity. You can have large holes and it has little to no effect on the, the strength. Elongation, it still matters. Okay, Lynn, I'm glad you said that because I, I had meant to mention that for our casting folks. You may want to choose an alloy. If you look at crowbars or these kind of bars, you're not trying to get a nice edge performance. You don't want to be up in the 55 Rockwell because you really want it to be a little bit forgiving. So it's more like a, a tomahawk you throw than a, a razor sharp knife you're going to cut meat with. You really want a little bit of ductility and toughness in that material. And Ben, you're really familiar with this as mm -hmm. a bladesmith. There are certain applications where you know it's going to have impact. And so yeah. you, you don't you don't make it as hard. Sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, give, given any choice of alloy, price is no, no object. Something like an S7 would be lovely for these things, you know, because it's just a shock absorbing steel. It's made for this kind of stuff. But it's it's ridiculously expensive compared to 4140 or something like that. Yeah. And so since our students get to do anything they want, we don't limit their cost effectiveness. They could look at an S7 or some other alloy that gives them real impact resistance. Mm -hmm. The one I've got up here, the basic design was a company called Azel, Andrew Broussard, and who uh, I think you mentioned last time, and Kevin Legacy from FDNY, uh, Broussard's from up in Canada. They did the original design on this, and then a guy named Fred Malvin, who used to work for IAF, bought the design and went from a two-piece forged and welded bar to a cast single-piece bar. So this is a failure. Uh, one of the whole fork ends came off. Wow. You might be able to tell a little bit from the metal there. It's a fairly tight grain structure um, mm -hmm. as far as, you know, from my uneducated eyes, but figured you might appreciate the close up there. Yeah. The friend of mine that did the Titanic thing worked for about 20 years doing failure analysis. And so our next session is looking at pictures like this and having him explain what he thinks he sees. Great session, fellas. Thanks. My pleasure.